In this video, I will be discussing the physical diagnosis of thyroid disease. The learning objectives will be first, to be able to demonstrate the general approach to the examination of the thyroid. Second, to be able to describe potential abnormalities of the thyroid on physical exam. And last, to list other common physical findings in thyroid disease. The thyroid exam tends to be one of the more difficult exams for trainees to learn well because the thyroid gland is relatively subtle in most people, preventing the immediate confirmation of correct technique. The key to a good thyroid exam is knowing the relevant landmarks. So I'll start by describing normal neck anatomy as it relates to the thyroid. The thyroid is a midline structure located in the midneck. It has a right and left lobe joined by a narrow isthmus. It has a close and relatively consistent relationship to other structures. Moving from superior to inferior, there is first the hyoid bone, which is not usually palpable in the midline. Next is the thyrohyoid membrane, also non-palpable. And then the thyroid cartilage, which is the most prominent landmark in the neck, and what is referred to by lay people as the Adam's apple. Immediately below the thyroid cartilage is the cricothyroid ligament or membrane, which is the location of cricothyrotomies, a procedure rarely used to obtain an emergent airway in situations of upper airway obstruction. Then moving downward is the cricoid cartilage, which is also palpable, but not as prominent as the thyroid cartilage. And below the cricoid cartilage, just anterior to the second and third tracheal rings, is where the isthmus of the thyroid is most commonly located, the two lobes extending outward laterally. The gland wraps itself around the anterior and lateral aspects of the larynx and upper trachea. It may have occurred to you already that these structures are poorly named as it's misleading for the thyroid cartilage to not be the one actually adjacent to the thyroid gland, but unfortunately these are the names with which we are currently stuck. So how do we actually examine the thyroid gland in a patient? As with any part of an exam, the first thing to do is inspection. On occasion, a patient may have an obvious enlarged thyroid, which is called a goiter, that is grossly visible. However, most findings discovered in the thyroid exam are with palpation. Palpation can be performed from two different approaches. The anterior approach, in which the examiner stands directly in front of the patient, or the posterior approach in which the examiner is behind the patient and literally wraps his or her hands around the neck. From the patient's perspective, the anterior approach is presumably preferred by most, although some clinicians feel that the posterior approach increases sensitivity for finding subtle abnormalities. How an individual clinician weighs these two concerns is a matter of personal preference. Begin palpation with a finger on the patient's chin and slowly slide it down the midline over the non-palpable hyoid bone and thyrohyoid membrane. The first significant palpable structure will be the laryngeal prominence of the thyroid cartilage. Keep following this downward until the finger slips into a small horizontal groove. This represents the location of the cricothyroid ligament. The cricoid cartilage is the firm structure immediately below the groove, and the thyroid isthmus should normally be just inferior to that, although it's not always clearly palpable. But once there, slide your fingers to either side of the midline and you should be able to feel the two lobes. With gentle pressure, roll your fingers over the lobes. Some clinicians prefer using the thumb on one side and the second and third finger on the other. Some clinicians instead prefer using the two thumbs and others prefer using the first and second fingers on each hand. I don't know if any of these three is necessarily superior to the others, What's far more important is correctly identifying the landmarks and thus ensuring that you palpate in the correct location. In the event that you think you may have found a nodule or mass but aren't sure if it's within the thyroid or if it's within a more superficial structure, you can ask the patient to swallow. As the thyroid is tethered to the swallowing apparatus, it rises when the patient swallows and so should a thyroid nodule. If it fails to rise, it indicates the nodule is in the subcutaneous tissue. Although they are most commonly located well above the normal location of the thyroid gland, thyroglossal cysts 
can occasionally be mistaken for thyroid nodules. These can be distinguished from the latter by asking the patient to stick out the tongue as far as it will go. Thyroglossal cysts will rise up with this action, whereas thyroid nodules should not move. So as you are doing the thyroid exam, exactly what types of abnormalities should you be observing for? First, I already mentioned a goiter, also known as thyroid megaly, which is simply an enlarged thyroid gland. Some goiters will be very obvious just on simple inspection of the neck, as seen here with a relatively modest goiter, and a substantially more prominent one. Other goiters will require careful palpation. Rarely, a goiter will grow downward into the chest rather than upwards and outwards within the neck. These substernal goiters are more problematic since they are more likely to compress adjacent structures such as the trachea, esophagus, and great vessels. Typical symptoms of a substernal goiter include frequent coughing, the sensation of food getting stuck in the throat when swallowing, and difficulty breathing while supine. Each of these symptoms are more commonly caused by other conditions, making a substernal goiter particularly difficult to identify. A dramatic eponymous physical finding of a substernal goiter is called Pemberton sign. In this finding, when a patient with such a goiter raises his or her arms over the head and holds them there for a minute or so, the face becomes red or occasionally cyanotic, with a sharp demarcation in the neck. The patient may feel fullness of the face or have an unusual sensation in the head, but they are not typically dyspneic or dizzy. There are competing hypotheses about the precise mechanism of this finding, but all involve extrinsic compression of the great vessels against the enlarged thyroid, resulting in venous congestion of the head. It can also be observed in patients with SVC syndrome. Another exam finding already mentioned are thyroid nodules. One should indicate the number of nodules as well as size and location of each and whether or not it is mobile. Tenderness of the thyroid gland can occur in the setting of severe inflammation. And the last finding which one should check within the thyroid itself is to listen for a thyroid bruit with your stethoscope applied over the thyroid gland. Thyroid bruits typically indicate hyperthyroidism and are most commonly described in Graves disease, though they are not highly specific for that particular condition. I personally don't typically bother listening for a thyroid bruit unless I'm specifically concerned about the possibility of hyperthyroidism based on history and other exam findings. Something that is important to realize about identifying a goiter is that its presence tells you very little about actual thyroid function on its own, as goiters may be present in patients who are hypothyroid, hyperthyroid, or even on occasion, euthyroid. Consider the following chart of common causes of goiters. Patients with iodine deficiency are typically hypothyroid. Those with multinodular goiter can be either euthyroid or hyperthyroid. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is usually hypothyroid. Graves' disease is hyperthyroid. Patients with subacute thyroiditis can have any clinical thyroid status, depending upon what stage of the illness they are currently in, although the hypo and hyperthyroid stages both tend to be relatively mild and short-lived. And lastly, goiters can be caused by infiltrative diseases such as amyloidosis and sarcoidosis, which can be either euthyroid or hypothyroid. So you can see that the fact that someone has a goiter tells you actually very little about the specific diagnosis or even what their thyroid status is. Before we move from this chart, I just want to point out that iodine deficiency is the most common etiology of goiter worldwide, while goiters in the U.S. are typically caused by either multinodular goiter, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, or Graves' disease. And although subacute thyroiditis doesn't necessarily lead to an obvious goiter um, in all cases, it is the most common etiology of a tender goiter when one exists. An aspect of the physical diagnosis of thyroid disease that may not be immediately apparent is that the most diagnostically helpful signs are physically removed from the thyroid gland. As thyroid hormone has an extremely diverse range of normal actions in the body, both hypo- and hyperthyroidism 
caused an equally diverse range of exam abnormalities. Starting with hypothyroidism, in the cardiovascular system, bradycardia is common, and in extreme cases, patients may be hypotensive. Regarding the dermatologic exam, their skin is often cool and dry, with coarse hair, brittle nails, and rarely a yellowish discoloration to the skin. This discoloration is thought to be secondary to decreased conversion of beta-carotene to retinol with subsequent hyperkeratinemia. Hypothyroid patients frequently have neurologic findings, specifically slow mentation, hypothyroid speech, which is characterized by slow, low-pitched, and occasionally slurred speech, which is partly a consequence of the deposition of mucinous material within the vocal cords, and hyporeflexia, which is associated with a prolonged relaxation phase of the ankle reflex. Two miscellaneous findings include hypothermia and non-pitting generalized edema, which is thought to be due to the accumulation of mucopolysaccharides in the subcutaneous tissue. This form of edema is occasionally called myxedema, which is similar to, but not identical to, pretibial myxedema, which is actually more classically described in Graves' disease in etiology of hyperthyroidism. And to add to the confusion, the term myxedema is occasionally used as an old-school synonym for hypothyroidism itself. In general, individual findings of hypothyroidism are more specific than sensitive. Thus, the presence of exam findings, particularly characteristic hypothyroid speech and coarse skin, argue for a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. However, there is no specific finding whose absence argues significantly against the diagnosis. It is certainly possible to be symptomatically hypothyroid without any physical exam abnormalities. Moving on to hyperthyroidism, it too has a large number of diverse findings. In the cardiovascular system, there is almost always tachycardia, which is usually sinus tachycardia, but is occasionally atrial fibrillation. Patients are frequently hypertensive, and they may have a flow murmur on account of increased myocardial contractility. The skin is frequently warm and moist, and hair is fine and abundant. The neurologic exam is frequently abnormal. Patients can exhibit psychomotor hyperactivity, which is also known as hyperkinesia. They can have pressured speech, a fine tremor, proximal muscle weakness, and generalized hyperreflexia. There are also several distinctive eye findings, such as lid retraction and lid lag. These are variations on the same phenomenon. In lid retraction, the patient has an unusual staring appearance caused by a widened palpebral fissure, that is, there is more than normal space between the upper and lower eyelids. In lid lag, the eyes appear normal at rest, but as the patient looks downward, there is a transient appearance of white sclera between the iris and the upper lid. The lowering of the upper lid, which normally accompanies downward gaze, is delayed by just a moment. Both lid retraction and lid lag are a consequence of sympathetic hyperactivity affecting the levator papibrae superioris and superior tarsal muscles of the upper lid. It's the opposite effect of the ptosis seen in Horner syndrome, where sympathetic activity to the eye is impaired. Although lid retraction and lid lag are frequently included in descriptions of Graves' disease, unlike other ophthalmological manifestations of Graves', these are not specific to that diagnosis. To test for lid lag, simply observe the patient with his or her eyes in the neutral position, then have them look up and then down, watching if a section of sclera becomes briefly visible directly above the iris as the patient looks downward. I'm going to return to the complete list of physical findings of hyperthyroidism for a moment. From a statistical standpoint, the physical exam is more helpful in either ruling in or ruling out hyperthyroidism than it is in hypothyroidism. First, the vast majority of hyperthyroid patients have palpable thyroid glands. Thus, a normal gland size on exam argues strongly against the diagnosis. Tremor and tachycardia are also relatively consistent findings whose absence would argue against the diagnosis. The findings which are most specific are 
and which argue most in favor of a diagnosis of hyperthyroidism are lid retraction and lid lag. You've probably noticed some strong parallels between the findings of hypo and hyperthyroidism. I'm going to highlight them because remembering that the two diagnoses have many opposite findings will help to remember each's presentation. When comparing hypothyroidism to hyperthyroidism, we see there is bradycardia versus tachycardia, hypotension versus hypertension, slow mentation versus psychomotor hyperactivity, slow low-pitched speech versus pressured speech, hyporeflexia versus hyperreflexia, cool dry skin versus warm moist skin, and last, coarse hair versus fine abundant hair. I'm going to conclude the video with a discussion of some notable physical findings that are specific for Graves' disease, which is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism in the U.S. The first is Graves' ophthalmopathy, which is seen in about 50% of Graves' patients. This is not one specific finding, but rather a constellation of related findings. The most well-known of these is exophthalmos, also known as proptosis. In exophthalmos, the eyes are literally pushed forward out of the orbit on account of fluid accumulation in the retroorbital space. The distinction between this and lid retraction, which is not specific for Graves, is much easier done from the side than from the front of the patient. Other findings of Graves' ophthalmopathy include lid and periorbital edema, limited eye movements, and something called compressive optic neuropathy. Symptoms of ophthalmopathy include the subjective impression that the eyes look different, irritation, excessive tearing, retroorbital pain or pressure, and in severe cases, visual loss. The visual loss, which is attributable to the optic neuropathy, is usually of such insidious onset and slow progression that patients may not even recognize it's happening during its earlier stages. Examination of the eyes in patients with Graves' disease should also include an assessment as to whether the upper and lower lids can close completely, as failure to do so will place the patient at a higher risk of corneal dryness and ulceration. The suspected pathogenesis of Graves' ophthalmopathy begins with the TSH receptor antibodies activating T cells, which release certain cytokines. These cytokines trigger fibroblasts to secrete glycosaminoglycans, which accumulate in the extraocular muscles and retroorbital tissues. This increases the oncotic pressure in those locations, which leads to fluid accumulation and forward displacement of the eye. The second physical finding, which is more specific for Graves' disease, is infiltrative dermopathy, which is seen in just 5% of Graves' patients. It is also known as thyroid dermopathy and pretubial myxedema. This consists of bilateral asymmetric plaques or waxy induration, usually on the shins. The pathogenesis appears to be very similar to the ophthalmopathy. An issue raised earlier in the video is the potential confusion surrounding the use of some of these terms. For example, it's common to hear clinicians refer to this finding as pretubial myxedema, Yet the term myxedema by itself is a historical synonym for hypothyroidism. Adding to the confusion is the fact that this entity of pretubial myxedema has been uncommonly described in both hypothyroid and euthyroid patients as well. And I've even heard people refer to any lower extremity edema in a patient with hypothyroidism as pretubial myxedema, irrespective of whether the type of edema seems remotely consistent with this diagnosis. Now, I won't pretend to know the history behind the confusing terminology, but I will recommend avoiding the term pretubial myxedema in favor of either infiltrative or thyroid dermopathy when associated with hyperthyroidism and just referring to it as plain old edema in any other context with the one qualifier as to whether or not it is pitting. That's the end of this video on the physical diagnosis of thyroid disease. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to like it or share it, and feel free to leave questions below. Lastly, 
If you haven't already seen them, you may find my other videos on thyroid disease interesting as well.